The Collective Whisper Podcast with Simon King. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Collective Whisper podcast. I am your host, Simon Kay. It's a pleasure to have you back here, guys. We hope you're enjoying the content and the guests. We like to have a great variety in the guests and to keep you happy. There's something for everybody. So if you're liking it, please share with your friends. Please subscribe. And most of all, enjoy the show. So moving on to today's guest. Our guest today is Tom Simon, a former FBI agent turned private investigator who has spent over 20 years in law enforcement and investigations. Tom has become an expert in white collar crime, fraud and corruption investigations and is the founder of Simon Investigations, a private investigation firm that provides comprehensive investigative and security services to individuals and businesses. Tom began his career as an FBI agent after earning a degree in criminal justice from a prestigious university. During his time at the FBI, he worked in a variety of cases, including high-profile white-collar crimes, fraud, and corruption. His expertise in these areas earned him several awards and commendations, including the FBI Director's Award for Excellence in Intelligence Analysis. Tom played a crucial role in the investigation and prosecution of a large-scale Ponzi scheme that defrauded investors out of millions of dollars. He used his expertise in financial crimes to help track down and gather evidence against the perpetrators which ultimately led to successful convictions. Tom worked on a case involving a company executive who had embezzled millions of dollars from his employer and laundered the money through offshore accounts. Using his extensive knowledge of financial crimes and investigations, Tom helped uncover the scheme and bring the individual to justice. Tom has also investigated cases involving public officials who abused their power for personal gain. In one high-profile case, he helped gather evidence against a state senator who had accepted bribes from lobbies in exchange for political favors. As technology has become more prevalent in our daily lives, Tom has also focused on investigating cyber crimes. In one case, he helped track down and apprehend a hacker who had stolen sensitive information from a large corporation. After leaving the FBI, Tom founded Simon Investigations, a private investigation firm that provides comprehensive investigative and security services to individuals and businesses. His experience and expertise have made him a valuable resource for clients looking to investigate complex cases and protect their assets. Some of his most noteworthy cases as a private investigator include uncovering fraudulent activity within a major corporation, identifying a cyber criminal responsible for a series of data breaches, and assisting with the recovery of stolen artwork. Tom's unique background and experience have given him valuable insights into the world of investigations and law enforcement. He is often sought after as a speaker and has appeared on several podcasts and news programs to share his knowledge and advice. Tom's advice for individuals interested in pursuing a career in law enforcement or investigations is to focus on education and training. He stresses the importance of staying up to date on the latest technologies and techniques in investigations and security and recommends that individuals seek out mentors and opportunities for hands-on experience. Tom Simon's career as an FBI agent and private investigator has given him a wealth of experience and expertise in law enforcement, investigations and security. His dedication to service and commitment to excellence have earned him numerous awards and commendations and his insights and advice are highly valued in the industry. Tom's unique background and perspective combined with his impressive track record of successful cases make him a valuable resource for anyone looking to learn more about investment investigations and security. So welcome to the show, Tom Simon. Oh, thank you, Simon. It's so nice to be on with you. And uh, I guess we get to give your audience the Simon and Simon show. And we were just talking there before we came on about Tom has relatives from County Mayo, your grandmother, you said, wasn't it? Yes, my grandmother was born there and immigrated to the US when she was a child. And so my family has a kind of deep history of affection for the people of Ireland. And um, and it's a place I've never been, but I've always wanted to go. I do a lot of work overseas in uh, Dubai. And which is a very international community with lots of European expats. And without question, my favorite people there are the Irish. So it was not a difficult sell when I heard from an Irishman who wanted to uh, put me on his show. I, I immediately jumped at the opportunity. And it's just an honor to be talking to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I was saying to Tom how I came across his profile. And it was very interesting for me, the work he did in the past with the FBI, but also the work he's doing now. And you can you know, follow Tom on social media channels, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all of these. And his videos are amazing because they're, they're short and sweet. And you always finish with this lovely catchphrase, be cool, you know. But it's really interesting because you can see how people get into this life of crime, sometimes accidentally, sometimes, you know, premeditated. 
But your little minute or 60 second videos sometimes encapsulate all that. So they're really good. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad you watched it. I'm glad you found it useful. Uh, the videos for me were an opportunity to market my private investigative services uh, by kind of telling stories that can span the my 30 year career in, as an investigator. Um, I had no illusions of ever becoming a you know a Kardashian or an influencer. No one wants to you know put their clothing on me to try out or have me sell them dietary supplements. But it's proven to be a very good advertising medium, and I get to meet nice people like you. So it, it ended up working out quite nicely for me. In a minute, we're going to go back on your career and some of the hype points and for you and you know how you start and everything but how long have you been retired from the FBI now uh, almost exactly to the day uh, two years I uh, retired at age 51 after 26 years as an FBI special agent in 2021 and uh, the next day I got my first client as a private investigator and it's been kind of uh, a, you know I got a real running start and it's been pretty steady thereafter so I guess in the world of private investigations I'm still relatively new at it as it's only been two years Okay, yeah, because I think there's a maximum age limit of 57, isn't there, in the FBI? Yeah, the FBI, uh, they walk you out the door on your 57th birthday, but you're eligible to retire at age 50 once you have 20 years in. And so I stayed until age 51. So it's really just a math problem for the agent as far as when is the right time for them to leave between age 50 and 57. And I thought I would be more productive and more marketable as a 51-year-old private investigator than a broken down old man at age 57. So tell us about Tom Simon as a, you know, as a youngster. What kind of child were you and teenager? Were you somebody who was like academic, sporty, nerdy? What were you like? I wasn't a great student by any stretch of the imagination, I, mostly because I didn't find school particularly interesting. I went to Catholic school. And uh, and so my grades were, uh, I don't know, in the US, we would call them you know low Bs, high Cs. I was always a bookish kid. Uh, you could see some books over my shoulder in the video here. And the um, I enjoy old detective novels from a, my young age. And so reading mystery novels was always sort of a, a, a dream of mine. But I was also athletic. I, liked, I played uh, American football in high school. I started wrestling which was good. And so I, I don't know, very happy childhood. I wish they could say there was some, you know, interesting trauma that I had to overcome, but I had wonderful parents and a nice family and I lived in good communities. Then when I went to college, I had an opportunity to pick my major, as people do, at university. And at the time I, I met somebody, I knew somebody whose dad was an FBI special agent. And that's something I had wanted to do for a long time for all the wrong reasons, Simon. I thought I'd be spending a lot of time jumping off moving trains and saving damsels in distress and all the stuff that I would read about in my detective novels and in Hollywood shows. And uh, But they said to major in accounting because at the time, uh, the FBI has always liked accountants to, um, to, be, to turn them into agents because a lot of what the FBI investigates are financial crimes, whether you're following money in and out of the mafia or whether you're dealing with, uh, with big embezzlements or Ponzi schemes or investment frauds. Um, having a financial knowledge and knowing how money moves through organizations is very useful. Then I majored in accounting. And so that's sort of the, the my, my career path as far as my education and what brought me to adulthood uh, and made me of interest to the FBI at that time. Yeah, it's quite interesting when you look at the FBI profile, you know, and of course, we there's a lot of myths and we see t things on television shows. And, you know, a lot of it is, for example, whether it's the FBI or CIA, you you kind of see, for example, with the CIA, they're looking for analysts. So a lot of the time, People imagine them to be spies and so on. But these people have to be very good and very academic and technical to analyze this material, whatever it is they're working on. So I imagine with the FBI, that's quite similar, isn't it? Yeah, the FBI hires investigative analysts and intelligence analysts who are separate than the agents, right? They have a desk job and they're very smart, educated people with high level degrees. The agents are the people who are out on the streets collecting the evidence and collecting the intelligence that the FBI uses to keep Americans safe. I was a criminal investigator, so my job was very similar to being a, a big city police detective. A crime happened and then it's a federal crime because of you know various you know legalities, and then it became my job to collect the evidence and then present those to a prosecutor and eventually to a jury to try to uh, convict the bad guy. So the agent has a different job. The agent definitely has a lot of analytical abilities, but we have intelligence analysts at the FBI who who do a lot of that um, that intel work for us, which is nice. A good agent should be out on the streets every day. Yeah, and I see also as well. Before the FBI, you were kind of involved in insurance and stuff. Was that kind of in criminal? Was that in investigation as well? Or was that kind of with an yeah, aspiration so I, to become an investigator? 
Right. When I graduated from the FBI in 1992, I was 22 years old. And the FBI just doesn't hire 22-year-old kids without work experience. And so I got a job with a big accounting firm called KPMG. They're they're an international company. And I started, I did about a year in their audit practice. And I was just miserable. I'm not a good accountant. And um, and, and it was kind of horrible. And I was just sort of biding my time till I got old enough to uh, enter the FBI. And um, But then all of a sudden, KPMG opened up a forensic and investigative services practice where they were conducting investigations of financial crimes for clients. So if a, a big uh, publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange had a major embezzlement or you know or loss of inventory, they would often bring in the CPAs from KPMG, people like me, to conduct that investigation for them. And this is fantastic. So I jumped at that opportunity to transfer into that practice and it was it was wonderful. I uh, I got great experience conducting investigations. It also gave me a safety net so I could be a professional investigator if I didn't get into the FBI. And so it, it to me it really laid out the groundwork for my FBI career. And honestly the career I'm doing now, which is exactly what I'm doing now. I have the same job now as a private investigator specializing in financial crimes as I did back when I was 22 years old, back in 1992, when I entered the KPMG Forensic and Investigative Services practice. Okay. And that's when you say that about coming out as a 22-year-old. So, you know, when you're training in Quantico, is it like it's portrayed in the movies? You know, is the FBI training more geared towards analyst work or is it like you know is it like local law enforcement training how is it different it's weird it's um it's it's a little bit i think the movie silence of the lambs did a very nice job of portraying the fbi academy uh, but obviously they're not going to send a new recruit out to investigate a big serial killer case while while they're a student but it's really a mixture between law school and military boot camp so you spend a lot of time in class learning us constitutional law and investigative techniques and kind of what what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do and then there's a lot of field training where they're teaching you how to shoot guns uh, both you know like long machine guns and your the handgun that you carry every day on the job and they're you're constantly being evaluated and tested for your marksmanship Ship. There's a lot of physical fitness training where you're, you know, doing a lot of running and push-ups and sit-ups. Uh, in your free time, you spend time lifting weights because throughout the course of the uh, 20-week academy, they're evaluating your physical fitness. And there's also the uh, defensive tactics training, where which is kind of like they're teaching you how to fight, basically. But the fighting is very different when you're a law enforcement officer because the whole goal is to get the bad guy on the ground so you can put handcuffs on him. It's not a situation where you're looking to go 12 rounds with someone. So, um, so it's so every day is a little bit different. You're living in the dorms there uh, with a roommate, which is kind of unusual um, and and a change of pace because a lot of the new agents are like 30 years old. And um, it was good. I mean, the training was excellent. It's not like a fun time, but you're learning really interesting things every day. And you, by the time you get out into your first office, you feel like you're kind of ready to handle whatever's being thrown at you because the academy is is very thorough as far as training you. One thing about the academy uh, your listeners may find interesting is that there's an entire city built in Quantico, Virginia at the FBI Academy called Hogan's Alley. It's a fake city and they bring in paid actors to like rob the bank every day and to, you know, and there's a pharmacy there and a motel there and a trailer park there. And so you go out there and you conduct mock investigations where everyone you're dealing with is a paid actor. And so you're practicing arresting people. You're practicing investigating a bank robbery, pulling fingerprints off of, uh, off of surfaces in this fake town in realistic situations. And so the U S government spends a fortune on uh, putting this together and making sure that it's, it's realistic training for the um, new agent trainees. I'm just thinking that you have a lot of the same suspects for different crimes. <laughs> yeah, 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 you, exactly. The guy you're arresting this week for bank fraud was the bank robber from two weeks ago. Yeah, so, yeah, I can uh, imagine lifting prints. You'll be like looking at the prints and after a few weeks, you'll be able to recognize them by eye. You're like, that's definitely John. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, again, I was a 25 year old accountant when I came into the FBI Academy as a student. And so I had no, and you know, no law enforcement experience or anything like that. And so I remember my first time putting handcuffs on one of these actors, I ended up cutting him in the arm and he's bleeding like a stuck pig. This is poor guy's an actor making, you know, making an hourly wage. And, uh, and so after they kind of call time out, I apologized to the guy profusely for, for kind of doing such a poor job of, of handcuffing him up that he was bleeding. And he could not have been more magnanimous and kind 
kind with me and patient with me as a new agent who clearly didn't know what he was doing at the time. Since then, I've learned how to put handcuffs on people properly so I don't actually torture them. Are there some situations where those actors are trained to resist or told to resist and make it more difficult? Absolutely. I mean, you're not you're not beating the hell out of them, right? <laughs> no. But but there's um but yeah, they do resist, and you have to kind of break them down and uh, and use your defensive tactics to put them on the ground so you can get the handcuffs on, and uh, that's part of the training. And these actors are incredibly rugged individuals who they're probably not making a ton of money, but they're actually they're making the FBI better because by the time we get out in the field, we're we're very well trained. I imagine as they go on with their job, they get better and better. So if you get an actor who's a pretty good actor, but he comes in then and maybe the supervisor says to him, listen, you're going to be involved in a criminal interview here. So we want you to make it really difficult. Like, for example, this new rookie and, you know, play psychological games. So I can imagine that happens a bit too, no? Yeah, because a lot of the training that they do with these actors is interview and interrogation. And so, you know, whether they're a witness and witnesses are often very scatterbrained and not really focused. This is their first time being interviewed by an FBI agent. And so the actors did a very good job of recreating that to, right. uh, you know, be talking about everything under the sun, except for the one thing you want them to do, uh, talk about, which happens all the time in the field. And so they're clearly well-trained and, and they, they, they don't just give you that information. Same when you're doing the interrogations of the actors, they're trained, um, uh, they understand what we are trained to do. And we are rewarded in that the actor will reward us for going through the proper steps of an interrogation then uh, and will punish us for doing poor, uh, doing, you know, doing a bad job. And so it's um, it's very realistic. When you went in, what was the kind of biggest challenge for you? Because you, as you said, you expected to be kind of Jimmy Cagney and jumping on trains and damsels in distress. <laughs> so once you got there and you saw what it was really like, what was the biggest challenge then? And how did you approach saying, how am I going to do this as a career? What's going to be my area of expertise? Yeah. So every, um, well, my big, there's two different questions. My biggest challenge at the academy, everybody walks in with a different challenge, right? Some people find the academics very difficult and are constantly in the verge of failing out. Other people, um, it's the physical fitness because they're older and, and maybe they haven't been working out in anticipation of going out to the academy. Those weren't problems for me because I was a young, I was 25 years old, pretty, you know, recently college graduate. And um, in the physical fitness, again, I was young and healthy. For me, it was the firearms. I was a terrible shot at the academy. And I was in, always in risk of being sent home uh, for not being able to uh, achieve the, the marksmanship scores that I needed to. And so I would spend all my time in the dorm rooms. They have these red handle guns. It's ex exactly the same kind of gun we would carry on the job, but all the firing mechanisms have been disabled and you know they're safe because they have a red handle. And so it's all the trigger pull, right? So I would just spend hours just pulling the trigger perfectly so I didn't wobble the gun or anything like that. And it took me dang near all of the 16 weeks to get to be a good enough shot to pass. And since then, I've been a fine shot. But it, that was the big stressor for me. I, you know, I was just so the idea of going home with my tail between my legs and having to tell my family and friends that I had failed out of the FBI Academy because I was unable to shoot was just a nightmare that I had for 16 weeks. But I pulled it together and everything worked out. The first thing I suppose a lot of people would think is, well, if you can't shoot, you shouldn't be a cop or an FBI agent. But it's a big challenge because, you know, not everybody's going to be a natural shot. And for a lot of people, they're going to have to work hard on the range every day, aren't they? Yeah. And it's a skill I just didn't have, right? We, we had people coming in who were former law enforcement or who were former military. And so handling weapons to them was second nature. And they looked at me like I was crazy while they're suffering on their legal tests or their, um, their, their, you know, foreign counterintelligence tests on academics. And so everyone has a challenge when you're there. And uh, and kind of overcoming that challenge is sort of you know they try to hire people who have that ability and so and for me like I said it was it was shooting it wasn't something that was in my background I had never really fired a handgun before I got to the academy and um, but they have great people the the instructors there are outstanding and so they're used to teaching nerdy accountants like me how to shoot <laughs> yes so I can imagine as well for you know like you said that you have all types of people you have jocks you have the nerds, the academics, everybody goes in there. 
but they probably find their own niche within it. And when you went in, did they kind of say to you, okay, this is your strength. We'll push you in that direction. No, that's what's so nice. So nice. Everybody walks in uh, with different qualifications, but your the degree you have and the qualifications you have when you come in really has nothing to do with the assignment you get once you're out in the field. Um, so we had people who are accountants who are working on uh, serial killer cases. We had people who were, um, you know, Arabic speakers doing bank fraud cases. And so the, um, those specialties are there and they, I, but they don't, the FBI doesn't always slot the computer scientists onto the cyber crime squad. And so I happen to gravitate toward financial crimes because I actually find that very interesting. I'd much rather do that than drug crimes because I don't really find the war on drugs particularly interesting to me. And so, um, so, and, but very rarely was I using any of my technical accounting skills to solve these cases. It's, um, we have forensic accountants at the FBI who do the number crunching. The FBI agent, if they're doing doing their job right are on the streets knocking on doors and talking to people yeah doing the legwork yeah that's why they hire us right um because they can put you can put us out on the streets and talk talk to strangers very well when you consider people who had been in law enforcement before so maybe they were in the local sheriff's office or the nypd or whatever and then they decide they want to go into federal law so you have let's say for example the fbi you have the atf you have the CIA. I mean, what else? What else is there? There's what do you call the Justice Department one? The DEA handles uh, drug crimes. Yeah, the DEA as well. Yeah, yeah. and there's the, the Justice Department have a, a one as well. No, the Justice Department is an umbrella organization under which the FBI and the DEA and the U.S. Marshal Service all fall. So yeah. So for you, when you decided you want to go into law enforcement, was the FBI the most obvious choice or did you look at ATF or how does that whole system work? Which one you choose? Yeah, it, it's, um, it, it's a great question. And for me, I thought you know, I always felt thought the, the FBI was the pinnacle of federal law enforcement because they, they have the best, most resources, the biggest budget. Uh, the most difficult application process and the widest variety of crimes they investigate. Uh, if you, you know, and so if you want to do white collar crime, the FBI is there for you. If you want to use drug crimes, the FBI is there for you. The good thing about the FBI, though, is that you get to work side by side with all these different agencies. There's a lot of collaboration. And so I know people, friends of mine who are in the ATF or DEA or um, marshals or Secret Service, and they're excellent agents. And I loved working with them every day. If I did not get that job with the FBI, I would have started applying for other agencies um, because I wanted to be a federal law enforcement officer. Um, but I got lucky that the FBI came through. Yeah. And something I didn't know about the FBI, because, you know, we see, for example, you know, the history of the FBI. But originally it was the BOI, Bureau of Investigation, that it changed its name, didn't it? Oh, yeah. You're going, you're going way back to the 1920s there. But yeah. There was a big history there. But I mean, was that, and then in 1935, it was renamed. So was that something that the BOI wasn't working or was it just a renaming for other reasons? The BOI, the Bureau of Investigation, was just a small division of the Department of Justice. And then a, a, a young attorney named J. Edgar Hoover started heading that up. And, um, and, you know, and Mr. Hoover had a lot of negatives about him, but also a lot of positives about him that he was ambitious and wanted to grow it into something else, its own agency. And so at that time, American law enforcement was very corrupt. It was, you know, the police departments, it was not unusual for police officers to take bribes. They were poorly paid. They were poorly respected. He had the innovation to professionalize law enforcement, right? To hire, to hire, you know, university educated, um, um, you know, men at the time, pay them a living wage and train them in the most sophisticated investigation investigative techniques. And the good thing for America and the world, I think, is that that rising tide of the FBI's professionalism of law enforcement lifted all boats. And so police departments started to get better and other federal agencies began to follow suit as far as properly training and paying their people to try to get the corruption out. And so that was his innovation um, and, uh, and how he was able to grow the FBI. Now, there were certainly abuses in the early days of the FBI under Hoover, and, uh, and he was an imperfect man in many ways. But administratively, he did a great thing by creating an agency that we can all be very proud of today. Yeah. And I mean, there's been lots of I, I don't want to call them experiments, but there's been lots of the FBI's kind of, uh, you know, these like the the counterintelligence programs, COINTELPRO and then InfraGuard. So with a lot of these other, I, I don't want to call them derivatives, but they're like subdivisions nearly or, or different sections of the FBI. Are these kind of things that the, the government 
asked to be created or the directors of the FBI come up with these ideas, do you think? Uh, it, as far as the genesis of them, I can't say. But the FBI is a weird organization, right? Because we have the criminal side of the house investigating federal crimes and putting people in prison. And then we have the national security side of the house who has a function of one, keeping us safe from counter ter- from terrorist attacks and two, catching and monitoring the spies that are inside the U.S. from threat nations. And those are two very different missions. And so every time the FBI gets in trouble for something, some some congressman, it occurs to them, why don't we split the FBI in two? And the FBI always resists that uh, because we feel we're a stronger organization having those two elements kind of working side by side under the same roof with each other. But I understand that instinct. And that's a very good observation, Simon, that that the FBI has, has many, many different missions that fall under the job of FBI. FBI special agent. My job as a criminal investigator working, you know, major financial crime cases was so different on a day-to-day basis than my friend right down the hallway who was working the the Chinese foreign counterintelligence squad monitoring Chinese spies in the US trying to steal our technology and uh, and bootleg it over in China. And so it was just a very different job, but there was always an opportunity if I felt like I got burned out in my job to transfer over and begin doing his job, which was very nice from a worker's perspective. Right. That's quite interesting, isn't it, that you can make that move. We all kind of hear about the FBI, you know, DNA and their their labs, like they have a huge lab and stuff, and they provide assistance to all police departments and and criminal uh, organizations around the world. Is that something that has always been an amazing lab or it's something that got better in the last few years? No, it's, it's always been an amazing lab and always been very well funded thanks to the U.S. taxpayers. And so the idea of kind of bringing science into law enforcement, um, you know, beginning with fingerprints and then DNA and now artificial intelligence, facial recognition, that's been those have been huge innovations. And the FBI has been at the tip of the sword as far as pushing those things forward, as well as their, the research they're doing there to develop new ways to solve crimes using science. And I see these things as all tremendous victories because it reduces the likelihood that we're that someone is going to be falsely convicted of a crime, which is every FBI agent's nightmare. Yes, and it's funny. The other day, my son said to me, "Dad, what what does the FBI stand for?" And I, I and I said, "Well, it's the Federal Bureau of Investigations." I said, "But they also have that fidelity, bravery, integrity." So I can imagine, like that last word, integrity. So. Over the years, you mentioned it earlier there about you know J. Edgar Hoover and. Because the FBI is so closely linked to federal government and, you know, we know governments can be corrupt. So over the years with the FBI, when you have that kind of bad smell coming from certain parts of it because of government interference or lobbying or anything like that, that's quite challenging because it brings down the name of the good agents then as well, doesn't it? Yeah, and I, I've spent some time on uh, FBI public corruption squads investigating corrupt politicians and, uh, and government officials. And, um, and I have to say that in that arena, the, um, the agents in the field, at the very least, don't see or feel that political pressure. Our only, our only mission is to do the right thing and collect the evidence correctly. Now, the, the political pressure is probably happening at FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C., and the U.S. Department of Justice, which is filled with political appointees uh, that the president has placed there. And that's the way our government just works. The FBI, though, has always tried to be above politics. And, uh, and sometimes we pa- succeed in that and sometimes we fail. But the reason that the FBI director is appointed by the president to a 10-year term is so that they're going to straddle multiple U.S. presidents. So the idea that, 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 I, that this, this FBI director is not going to be Trump's guy or Obama's guy. He's, he's a 10-year appointment guy or woman, uh, but so far it's been guys, who will be um, serving under multiple presidents. And the ability to give the president proper advice on criminal matters and foreign counterintelligence matters, I think the presidents historically have treated that as a real gift, that this is not something who's going to tell me just what I want to hear because their job is contingent upon their loyalty to me. Of course. And I can imagine in the overlap of presidents, you know, where the director, for example, might have a good relationship with the current president, but then when the new president comes in and has different ideas, that can be quite tumultuous, that relationship, because it's like, well, you're not doing what I want. And he's like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm here now for another six years or whatever. I, I came in the same time as the last president or before that. So you have to live with it and we have to work together, don't we? 
Yes, but again, the if a, a good FBI director and a good president will be mission focused, and the president will appreciate the FBI because you know the president basically is going to be taking credit for the FBI's wins that this occurred under my watch. We caught this spy, we caught that spy, and so a good president will understand that being a cheerleader for the FBI ends up benefiting them in the long run. Let's talk a little about wire fraud because you know I I imagine when that term was coined, you know, back in the the fifties or whenever it was coined, it. Was- was to do with a lot of, you know, mail fraud and everything. But now we have, you know, the internet, we have mobile phones, we have so many forms of technology. So have they had to change the whole definition of wire fraud over the years? And and about like, because federal law has been broken? Unfortunately, no. And I wish they did. Uh, the the wire fraud is a broad statute. That means using any type of interstate communication, which generally happens on the wires. Even your cell phone call at some point is hitting a fiber optic cable or, you know, or the internet, any type of interstate uh, communication to deceive someone um, in, you know, out of their money, which is the definition of fraud. Fraud is theft yeah. by, oh, sorry, let me try that again. Okay. Okay. Fraud is theft by deception. And so anytime you're using interstate wires, whether that's the internet or the phone or even a fax machine to do that, it falls under the wire fraud statute. As an agent, it was always a real pain in my rear end um, to have to deal with wire fraud because I could prove the fraud just fine. I could show that someone lied to you, Simon, to take money from you and then uh, and, and the economic damage, we're looking at the, your bank statements. But then at the end of the case, the prosecutor is always going to ask me, okay, what is the interstate wire that happened in furtherance of this case? And I'll be like, well, I don't know. The bad guy called Simon, Simon wire transferred the money. But then I needed to go out and actually prove that element of the crime. I needed to go out and get the bank statements to show that wire transfer going from one U.S. state to another U.S. state or internationally. I needed to show a phone record showing that phone call that was made from one or the other because those are the counts in our indictment that the bad guy is being charged with. As an agent, it always seems stupid to me that I'm running around looking for, in the case of mail fraud, a a canceled stamp or wire fraud, some wire transfer that happened to be interstate. Um, why don't we just have a law that says any theft by deception involving an inter- involving interstate activity and in, uh, or any you know or from an interstate uh, company or something like that? But uh, but the wire fraud statute has stuck around and it's, it's so broad we can do it. It's just a it creates an extra legal hurdle for me as the agent to have to go out and look for a canceled stamp or a phone call. When you think about nowadays, the internet, it, there's so many possibilities opened up for people. And recently I was talking to someone about the whole thing of like um, all these virtual credit cards and fake, you can get fake emails and fake numbers. And now Apple have hide my may, hide my email, all of these things. So in the case, for example, sometimes where people sign up for trial services, but they don't use their real name and they use things, that could in some way kind of be wire fraud, but it's very minimal. So how how do you deal with all of that now? Because maybe it's a very, very slight case and the prosecutor would never touch us. But like, so how do you define the definitions of it nowadays? Honestly, it's a, it, it's so broad that nearly everything can be considered an interstate wire, but you still need to prove that the wire itself happened. And so, right. so for, here's an example for you. Um, are you an iPhone user or an Android phone user, sir, Simon? I'm an iPhone user, iPhone. I'm an iPhone user also. And so when I send a text message, let's say you were at the house next door and I send you a text message. Um, and uh, But let's say you're an Android user. That text, me- that text message is going to be green, right? When an iPhone person talks to, right? That is not an interstate wire because that's a that's bouncing off. A, that's a cell signal. It's bouncing off the cell phone tower from my house to your house, from my phone to your phone. However, if it's a blue text message, if I'm sending, if you're still right next door to me here in Florida, I am sending you that I message. That's a blue message. That's an internet communication that is going on the internet, bouncing off an Apple server in California and, and, and arriving at your house at instant speed. That is an interstate communication and a wire that can be used in furtherance of a wire fraud case. And I worked two cases in my career that hinged on the, whether the text message was blue or green as far as charging the individual with wire fraud. Wow. And But it's, I don't want to, like, the word is, I suppose I have to say it, but it's quite anal in the respect that people can be tried over something that's so technical but uh, between a blue and a green thing that it kind i'm sure some agents do kind of go 
Yeah, but are we really going to follow this guy over this? I mean, so is there a point where where you say some cases are not worth following or does the law say you have to follow it? Understand that the the real meat of the case is the fraud itself, right? If yeah. I'm sending you that text message telling you that that you know that as an offer for you to invest a million dollars in my Bitcoin, uh, 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 so the the substance of the case has nothing to do with the wire itself. The wire is just a mechanism that a hook that allows us to charge this thing federally. The FBI is not working small benign cases just because a text <laughs> message yeah. was green or blue. I reverse engineer it, Simon. I work the fraud. And, and, and compute the loss and do all that legwork, all the law enforcement legwork to make sure this is a big, meaty, substantial case that's going to appeal to a jury. And then the last thing I do in the case is to prove up the wire itself, the blue text message versus the green text message. So so I want you to think of the wire as incidental. It's a legal hurdle we need to get over. I do. I understand now. It really, it's the context of the crime because if it's if it's the guy who just sends something but is not intentionally out to defraud someone or it's it's a minuscule thing but then if you have that million dollar crypto deal or forex or whatever that they're trying intentionally to defraud someone the minuscule details is what you need to prove the case exactly and u.s fraud um charges must require intent to defraud no one is sitting in an orange jumpsuit in prison on fraud charges who just happened to make a bad mistake these are individuals who intended to defraud someone and then pulled out a scheme to defraud them yeah yeah like i i was watching your video about the um, the guy the social media influencers who you you got their messages on discord and stuff so the messages clearly show that you know these people are a bunch of idiots and everything so they know exactly what they're doing and they are intending to you know defraud these people of their money aren't they exactly yeah and so that that's key and so those type of messages or emails or to each other where they're talking about how they intend to rip someone off becomes a very good piece of evidence for us that this wasn't just because again, I'm not the bad investment police. I'm the fraud police in these situations, right? You can you can make a bad. I can introduce you to a crypto investment, and you lose everything you had. As long as I actually made that crypto investment for you with your money, then you just made a bad investment. However, if you if I tell you I'm going to invest your money in crypto, and then I go to Las Vegas and gamble it away at the casino, you didn't sign up for that. At that point, you've been lied to and defrauded. And so that's the difference between a bad investment and a investment fraud, from my perspective. Yeah. So. You know, you've been involved in some Ponzi schemes and, you know, investigating them. Tell us a little about that or, or your biggest case in that area. Sure. A Ponzi scheme nearly always begins with a call from a victim saying, hey, I invested a bunch of money and uh, with a high rate of return and a low risk, which immediately sets off a bell in my mind because there's no such thing. And, uh, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I think I may have been defrauded. The guy, you know, I was receiving payments for a little while and then they stopped. And so I end up having that interview with the victim and hopefully there's multiple victims to find out what is it you were told ahead of time that your money would be invested in that separated you from your money before you invested. I want to know the lies that you may have been told. And then I go out and I take a look at the bad guy's bank account records and I see how do they actually spend the victim's money and the distance between those two things, what they told the victim and what they actually happened with the money is really the quality of the evidence in my case. And so that's how the uh, Ponzi scheme happens from a mechanical perspective. And so the agent spends a lot of time talking to each victim, uh, understanding what they were told that separated them from their money taking a look at the bank statements of the bad guy. And once you have a good feel about what happened, then I would approach the bad guy and try to get a confession from him or her. And, um, and they would sign that confession quite often because I'm a good interrogator. And then the case generally would end up pleading guilty and not even going to a jury uh, because the evidence would be so strong. And there's a significant benefit in the federal system of criminal justice for the bad guy to plead guilty rather than go to trial and lose. You know, one thing I noted from one of your cases as well was that, you know, th this term rolling over in each other. So when you get a group of guys or girls and they, you know, are intending to defraud someone, once they're caught, it kind of is how you interrogate them and how you get them to roll over on the other people, isn't it? Yes, uh, there, there's a tremendous benefit in this uh, federal system of criminal justice to be the first one in the door to cooperate if you are involved in a criminal conspiracy. And being able to play the bad guys against each other saying, 
listen, you can tell me exactly what happened and get on board and become a government witness ta- t- explaining to us exactly how this occurred, or you can sit around and wait until your friend does exactly that, and then you end up going to jail for a lot longer. The, p- the line I would always use with the bad guys is that it is better to be on the government bus than under the government bus at that time. And, th- and the first one in the door gets the best deal. Of course. And an interesting fact as well about the whole federal system is that the, there's no parole, isn't there? I think that's right. And so that was an interesting case where, you know, that guy was in the halfway house and he was a bank robber. And, and then he came out on the weekends and he was robbing banks and he leaving clues behind. He, he was a bit a bit of an idiot when it came to, you know, covering his tracks. Yeah, that wasn't my case, but it was a recent FBI case where a, a guy got out of jail, uh, prison uh, for bank robbery. And while he was in the halfway house, which is how you spend the last 10 percent of your uh, your sentence, he was a, he got family leave where he could go visit his family on the weekends. And when he was out for those family leaves, he began robbing banks and ended up getting caught. And the, uh, the again, the federal system of criminal justice definitely. Um, discriminates against people with a criminal past. And so if you are out on uh, on family leave for bank robbery, the judge is really going to throw the book at you. And that's exactly what happened to that guy. And so, you know, for Europeans, explain to us a little more about the differences between state laws and federal laws. So like sometimes you'll see on TV shows or movies where someone will commit a crime and they won't realize that they've committed a federal crime. And then, for example, the uh, the police officer or the agent might say, you know, that's a federal offense. And they'll be like, it, really? So because then, as you said, maybe there's no parole or maybe there's a higher sentence. So do the do the differences between federal and state laws change over time or are they always being the same? Well, Congress is constantly passing laws all the time, and as our local governments. But the key thing, there's three things that make something a federal crime. And uh, the first is that the crime has an interstate element, which means that the the crime itself, or the criminals, or the victims, um, are in two different U.S. states, right? And that's just a, a pure administrative matter. That means that the state of Virginia does not have to try to coordinate with the police in Maryland. Where we, it can just be a federal crime where the FBI is handling it. The second is if the government itself, the federal government is a victim. And we see this in situations where someone is is using some kind of government contract fraud or ripping off our um, our national health insurance. Um, if the government is a victim of the crime, then it automatically becomes federal. The third is if the government if the if the crime itself happened on a federal reservation of some kind, and that would be a, a military base, for example, then it would become a federal crime. Or if a, a crime that occurred at the U.S. Capitol, like the January six riots, or a crime that might occur at the Pentagon, um, those those automatically would become federal crimes. And then there's sort of a fourth category of just weird situations. Um, for instance, the any crime against a bank, a bank robbery or a bank fraud, because the banks and the deposits in those banks are insured by the federal government. Anytime you victimize a bank, that's a federal crime. Whereas, if, So if you stick a gun in a bank teller's head and take the money, then the FBI investigates. If you stick a gun at the in a gas station attendant's uh, um, ear and take their money, then the police are going to investigate it. Same crime, but the, the fact that the victim has different standing. Also, any crime on the high seas. I've worked a murder on a cruise ship, for example. And um, and so because there's just no real logical jurisdiction for what state would handle that, the FBI handles that. And crimes aboard aircrafts, uh, if there's an assault or a rape or, or a theft on an aircraft, you know, flying above the U.S. or oh, That would be like when you say crimes on the high seas are in the air, but that's only for U.S. citizens, is it? I think so, yeah. That's probably makes sense. I, I think... Um, I don't a maritime law is a mess. I don't really quite understand it. It's very very complicated, but but yeah, I mean if a if someone from Norway punches a guy from Sweden on a carnival cruise ship, the FBI has no dog in that fight. No, no, no. Because yeah, I was thinking maybe it might be to do with international waters if you're let's say in the Florida Keys in the water, but it's probably more to do with federal or like US citizens being murdered while it's abroad and so on. Right. But I wonder if the ship has to either uh, begin, the cruise needs to begin or end in the U.S. waters. Again, it's not my expertise. Okay. In, yeah, you know, okay. On a U.S. port. And so, yeah. So the, cri- the crimes I've, I've investigated or had been a party to were all on, uh, on cruise ships, luxury cruise ships, leaving from Florida headed to the Bahamas. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, and I saw that case, one of them where, where the guy pushed his his Tinder girlfriend off yeah. the balcony. And I, there, there's been a few of those kind of cases in Europe as well, where I know there was one Irish guy and his he had a Malaysian or an Asian wife and she went missing. And that case is still up in the air because it's a very difficult case without a confession, I suppose, to investigate because... You know, you maybe don't have the same type of witnesses and the same vigilance is not there on a boat, is it? Yeah, we got, yeah, we got lucky in my case because when uh, when the subject picked up his girlfriend by the throat and threw her over the balcony in his um, in his cabin, she happened to like land on the another floor of the cruise ship, another deck of the cruise ship, three decks below. So she fell 30 feet to her death, kind of bouncing off the life rafts and this railings along the way. Whereas had she been thrown off in the water, it would have been a much more difficult case for us to make. Yeah, because that's kind of the thing is that the, if there's no body, it's harder to prove the crime, isn't it? Yeah, there's only been a handful of murders in the U.S. that have been convicted without a dead body. And uh, I've had some cases where that was very relevant, where we're in garbage dumps looking for the victim's body because otherwise we're not going to make the case. I had other cases where where we were 100% certain who did it, and the um, but we never ever were able to recover the body. And so the bad guy went uncharged. Wow. Okay. And that other case, you know, you had a case to do with Congress and, and, and the, you know, the scandal in Washington and so on. So when you're investigating members of Congress or you're looking at any type of inappropriate behavior or corruption or anything, do you find then you're not sure who you can trust or like because you just don't know who's connected to who, do you? Well, when it comes to investigating politicians, um, I, I say you can't trust any of them. But <laughs> but the um, but the the investigation itself is 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 very similar to the other investigations. You're out there trying to develop human sources, and uh, if the investigation is covert, you're trying to develop electronic sources through wiretaps and bugs. And then, uh, in you know, w- the problem is once the case is overt, once everyone knows that the investigation is happening, the elected officials are generally smart enough to get attorneys. And so you don't get that that easy access to them you did before. So you find yourself doing a lot of negotiating with witnesses and their attorneys to ha- sit down and actually have a meeting, which ends up being a little more boring because the FBI agent at that point just sort of becomes a highly paid stenographer while the prosecutor ends up doing the lion's share of the interview. And so... Um, but, you know, the FBI has put a lot of Congress people in prison over the years and elected officials, governors, city council people. And so we have a decent track record um, in the world of public corruption of, of getting the bad guy, regardless of their political influence. And then have you seen over your career where, for example, there has been corrupt FBI agents? I know hopefully there hasn't been many, but that maybe people you had worked with or had known of in the past who had maybe taken bribes or been involved in corruption. Is that a very hard thing to investigate? Yeah, I mean, when I was a new agent, uh, or I wasn't that new, I was probably five years in, is when the FBI learned that a high-level um, FBI agent at FBI headquarters named Robert Hansen had been spying for the Russians for years. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. taking our taking our secrets and selling them to the Russians for money. And um, and so, you know, something like that hits you right between the eyes, right? Because this, you know, I didn't know him personally, but I know people who worked very closely with him. And uh, and that level of betrayal is just crazy. I was fortunate to work on very good squads. So while I had colleagues who got in trouble for like maybe misusing their FBI car on the weekends when they're not supposed to be using it for personal use and kind of small, small time stuff, I never had any colleagues get in trouble for taking bribes. Um, I think most people don't try to bribe FBI agents, one, because that's a federal crime. And two, because FBI agents are fairly well paid in kind of in the in the scheme of things. I mean, we're not millionaires, but it's uh but but the you'd have to give an FBI agent a lot of money to try to you know, can betray their oath of office. And the risk to the person offering that bribe is insanely high. And so none of so I had colleagues who've gotten in trouble, but I haven't had any colleagues who had gotten in trouble for taking bribes or any overt corruption. But during my twenty six years as an FBI agent, stuff happened. You know, I mean there were agents who were spying for for all sorts of different uh, foreign governments. And uh, and you just sort of scratch your head and wonder what, what happened in their lives that led them to that point. Yeah, of course, I imagine. And for you, what kind of what cases as an FBI agent stand out for you that you were most proud of and you enjoyed working on the most? I think one of the cases I look back on that that um, that changed my 
my outlook on things was after the 9-11 attacks uh, in 2001. I was, I was a bank fraud agent. I was happy as a clam. I was working my little bank at Teller Embezzlements and, and you know, working a, many, many, many small cases. And then the 9-11 attacks happened. The planes start flying into buildings. And overnight, the FBI really needed to rejigger itself into becoming an intelligence agency with the priority of keeping Americans safe from future terrorist attacks. And so I was put on a team of people who were investigating some uh, some charities that were taking money from kind of good Islamic people who were giving who were basically tithing or giving what they call their zakat to help out the poor and needy of the Islamic world. But these charities, instead of actually giving the money to poor, the poor and needy, they were funneling it into Islamic fighting groups, including Al Qaeda. And so it was my job on my team to actually prove that up. And we ended up proving it, shutting these charities down, seizing their money. Uh, deporting some of their leaders and uh, and throwing in prison other other leaders. And the idea was that we're going to be cutting off the blood money that Al Qaeda was using to kind of finance its its uh, its own you know terror missions. And so I look back on that, and that was a really interesting part of my life because I learned a lot. I I, I was a fraud agent, and so the idea of um, of kind of getting involved with that level of international intrigue was interesting to me. But ultimately, I I always made the case that it boiled down to a fraud case, right? They were taking money from these good Muslims and uh, and lying to them about what they're going to do with their money. None of these Muslims would have given a penny had they known that this this these were going to buy, you know, bullets, bombs and guns. And uh, and so they were defrauded. And um, and so I think coming at it from that approach ended up being very useful to the investigative team. During that whole, you know, 9-11 kind of event, where were you when it happened? And, you know, what were you were you on the job? Were you? Were you off work, or and how did you have to respond? I remember that morning. I was uh, I was at my office in Chicago with the FBI. I worked at an FBI offsite because we had kind of outgrown our normal FBI office, and so there was a building right next uh, down the street from the Sears Tower, which at the time was the world's tallest building. And I was working there in that building on a bank fraud squad. And uh, and then I remember I was going to be going out and doing an interview with a friend on a bank fraud case. And he called me and said, hey, I'm on my way in, but you need to go in the conference room and turn on the TV. Someone flew a plane into one of the World Trade Center towers. And in my mind, I was thinking like some was some guy in a little Cessna who uh, you know got off track. And then I turn on the TV and uh, and then we see the second plane live on television fly into the second tower. And the whole time, we're all looking up out the window at the Sears Tower, wondering if that was going to go down next. And so it was a, a terrifying day for America. And we all set our cases aside and worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week to try to investigate that crime and make sure that no one else was going to be doing similar acts. It was, it was just an absolute terrifying time for Americans. But for an FBI agent, it was great to see the FBI come together on one big case and set all your other leads and cases aside and begin working uh, working in the systems we have when a critical incident happens. I suppose, you know, the thing about it is, I remember when that event happened and like that, I turned on the news and you, I saw the, the first event happening and then you're like, oh my God, what is this? And then the the on like the disbelief of the second plane hitting, you're like, okay, this is no accident. It was a huge day. You know, people always ask, where were you when such a person died? But that was, you know, one of those days. What were you doing? What, what did you see it? Were you watching? Yeah. You know, now looking back at that as well, and, and we also have to deal with the whole all of these conspiracy theories about 9-11 and about there being interference and was it made to look like was it false flags and everything. So that must be a hard thing for people who work in the type of agencies like the FBI or like even people who have lost people in the firefighters and yeah. to think that there was any chance that there's governments involved. So how do you deal with that kind of those accusations about that now? Or did you ever have any doubts yourself? Well, there was no doubts myself, right? Because I knew people who responded to each one of those crime scenes, the one in Pennsylvania at the Pentagon and the uh, and the Twin Towers. The other thing I know, I, and I had a, a friend from my academy class uh, contract cancer from the fumes because he was working at Ground Zero right. in New York, yeah, and so yeah. he ended up dying as a result of 9/11. You know, years later, and um, years and later, so, yeah. and I'm there in the room while we're collecting up the information. United Airlines, which is one of the uh, companies that had the planes hijacked, they they're based in Chicago, 
And so I'm in Chicago at the time. So we're receiving data and the flight logs from United Airlines. And we're going through looking, doing background checks on every single passenger there to find out who might be the actual hijackers who were responsible for this. And from those lists, and then I know they were doing the same thing at Dallas with American Airlines, to, uh, we were able to put together exactly the late, likely suspects and begin building out dossiers as far as who they were, where they came from, what their movement was like while they were in the U.S. And so the idea that some kid who wasn't even born there is hopping on TikTok saying this thing was a false flag operation or or the FBI did this or it was a controlled explosion. It's just absolute sheer nonsense. And so it irritates me, but I also know that it's coming from a place of true ignorance. And so perhaps we just haven't done a good enough job as a government telling the true story about what occurred that day and, uh, and the events that led up to that day where people are uh, and, you know gravitate toward these silly stories on the internet. So do I take it personally? No. Do I find it irritating? Yes. Yeah. And you know, it's a very delicate issue because we all... In, we all, in our own way, want the truth, you know. And the thing is, when with misinformation and false information, you can choose to look at it. But if you're not a victim in any way of that event, it doesn't affect you so much. Like, so, for example, somebody could say to me, oh, do you think was that a conspiracy theory? And I can say, I don't know, but it doesn't really have any relevance to me. But when you're somebody who's lost family or you've lost friends, because of it, even if it's been years later, that's in some way, it's like an insult to their memory. And that's the delicate thing about this whole issue, isn't it? Yeah. And I, we had a, an incident here where uh, years ago where where the, a school or a town called Sandy Hook, someone went in and, yes, and, sh- yes. and killed a bunch of kindergartners there. And it became a popular um, misconception or, or conspiracy theory that, that that killing never took place. And these dead kids were, were, were crisis actors. And so I can only imagine the grief that a family member must experience if they lost their kindergarten or child, but then compounding that with some idiot on the internet spreading the rumors that that kid never actually died and that that family, that grieving family are paid actors is is just abhorrent to me and and I couldn't even imagine what they're going through. Um so yeah, so I find all these things very irritating. It's but it's a product of our internet time and and I spend zero time giving them it. I don't burn any calories thinking about them. No, the other thing about that is the problem with those kind of accusations or conspiracy theories is that when something does come up that needs to be investigated, that could be, you know, a lie or a false flag. The problem is that even if that's real, all the other things, it's like crying wolf and it doesn't get looked at the same way. Right. Absolutely. And so... It uh, it makes life worse for all of us. Um, the uh, the kind of the, the quickness people are to believe these urban legends and false stories. I also think that most of these conspiracies that would require dozens or hundreds of people in the government acting in concert to do something truly evil um, fall apart on examination only because you're really counting on a hundred people to not talk about something awful that they've done. And and government workers one aren't that good at, at keeping secrets, and two they're certainly not that good at uh, at, at doing rotten things and having no one find out about them. Yes, of course, of course. So moving on then from when you left the FBI. So was that a was that a hard decision to leave or did you feel you had done your base or what was kind of behind that process of leaving? Yeah, it was a hard decision because it was a job I loved. I woke up every morning. So much of my identity was tied up in being an FBI agent. I mean, over half of my life was spent as an FBI special agent. And so so it was a very difficult decision, but again it came down to a math problem. I have to leave by between age 50 and 57. At that point, at age 51, I had 26 years in, but there was also a demographic reality. So in 2021 is the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Following the 9-11 attacks, the FBI, the CIA, and a bunch of other federal agencies hired thousands of new agents and operatives, all of whom are going to be hitting their 20 years and eligible to retire. And so I'm going to be competing with all of those people for jobs and clients unless I got out first. And so um, I could have sat there at the F- at my desk at the FBI and had a great time for another five, six years. But at that point, any job or or even ability to attract clients as a private investigator is going to be, an, I'm going to be doing that in a way more crowded field than I would otherwise. And so it was, it was just time for me to go and, uh, and launch my own business. Yeah, I suppose there's a time to jump ship and the right time to land on your feet. And 
as you said it, it's better to get out now or at that time and make something before the herd comes along, isn't it? Yeah. And you know, I didn't want to be that broken down old man at my desk at the FBI, just kind of complaining about everything. And so I, I thought I would hit the, hit the ground running and leave on a high note. Yes. And was it an obvious choice then to go into being a PI, a private investigator, or were there other areas that you looked at, like consultancy as well? Or Well, you know, I feel I, I've been an investigator for my entire adult life. And so I, I don't feel like I'm really qualified to do much of anything else. And so um, and the idea of working for myself seemed like a really interesting option. Uh, the, I, I, the, I, didn't, I had reached a point in my FBI career where my bosses trusted me and understood my abilities to make cases. And so I wasn't being micromanaged or watched at all uh, by my supervisors. I just kept bringing the bad guys in. They were thrilled with my results. I wanted to have that same experience as opposed to going to, to J.P. Morgan Chase or some big financial company where I'm working on an investigative staff there in their internal security department kind of being scrutinized by corporate overlords. That just never really appealed to me. I wanted to be able to make my own hours and be my own boss and give a chance at actually doing this as a business, helping out clients answer the questions in their lives. It's that kind of the end of one road and the beginning of another. And I can imagine for a lot of people, they're like, well, what do I do? Do I relax? Do I you know, enjoy my life? Do I get a fishing boat? You know, Or do I go into another line of work that's something similar and use the skills that I've learned to continue? Yeah, again, the idea of kind of like sitting home watching Netflix and farting into my couch for 20 years before I have a heart attack just didn't really appeal to me. Yeah. So how is your work different now as a PI? How is your work very different to being an FBI agent? Do you like do you still have the same level of leg work you have to do or do you do a lot from your desk? <laughs> yeah, I, I have to now subscribe to databases that are available only to licensed private investigators. And so there's a okay. lot of overhead costs involved with that. Uh, whereas opposed to the FBI databases are are way better. Um, yeah. The and so I do a bit of work from behind the desk here at my office where that you see behind you in the video. And um, but I'm also on the streets a lot doing surveillances or talking to people or doing interviews um, just like I did before. I would say in the private sector you need to kind of understand that the the cases are going to be less substantive than they were at the FBI. The stakes are going to be lower. The, my cases mean the world to my clients, but there's the the kind of the global repercussions of them are far less. Thank heavens. As a private investigator in the U.S., what would you say is the kind of average type of cases? Is it divorce cases, you know, uh, cheating, adultery, that kind of stuff? Or is it insurance stuff? For most private investigators in the U.S. are making a living doing insurance investigations where someone is being paid an insurance policy um, for and they uh, saying they're too they got injured on the job and then the the investigator goes and tries to take pictures of them you know pouring concrete in their driveway that's showing that they're not injured i never really found that work particularly interesting and the money's not so good and so i ne i have not gravitated toward that work i do some divorce work and family case, family law cases where we're trying to establish um, something so people can get a better deal with their alimony or their custody arrangement for their kids I don't particularly like that work also, but I have a mortgage to pay. My favorite kind of cases are the corporate ones where a company is hiring me to find out um, to build an embezzlement case uh, that, um, that, you know, a big, a big fraud took place at a company or an individual who was ripped off in an investment fraud scheme. They want me to investigate that investment fraud scheme and then approach the bad guy to, uh, to gauge their willingness to pay back the money. Um, or else I'm going to make a criminal referral to my former colleagues at the FBI. So I've been having a, a lot of luck lately recovering money for clients who have been ripped off in frauds. Okay, yeah, because the embezzlement, in, embezzlement cases, I suppose, could be quite interesting when you're dealing with big companies and, you know, staff trying to get money or finding ways to hack into the system. And I noticed on one of your videos, you talked about AI. So, you know... The thing about AI, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it the correct information? So has I, AI crept into your investigative world yet? Not too much um, you know, as far as you know, doing research on companies sometimes, but AI is so unreliable right now. This is sort of like, I feel like this that we are in the, the beginning of the AI era with ChatGPT. And so you, know, you type stuff, you type a question into ChatGPT, it should be used as a starting point, not an end point as far as the answers you end up getting out of it. And a lot of the, the problem is if ChatGPT doesn't know something there's something about the algorithm that it doesn't 
say, I don't know, you know, good question. I just have no idea or I can't find any information about that. Instead, it seems to spit out just a totally fictional story. And, uh, and so that can be very dangerous. And so as long as investigators understand that chat GPT needs to be a starting point in their research, not an end game, I think it ends up being a great tool. I also think in 20 years, we're going to look back on it. And it's going to be something absolutely amazing compared to what it is now, right? We're we're like sort of where AOL was in 1994 yeah. um, in the world of AI. And just looking at what the internet now does and can do is is unrecognizable when you take a look at 1994 America Online. Yeah, and you, I think the thing that chat GPT or any AI is missing now is like fact checkers because, you know, it tells you it will give you this information, but it mightn't be correct. And I, I, for a, a lot of people, let's say they might do research or write articles, but then you have to be very vigilant and diligent about what's in them and are they correct factually. So that's probably the next phase of it, like where it can correct itself. I mean, I've used it once or twice and uh, you'd say, oh, well, that's not true. And it'd say, oh, excuse me, I was thinking of a different person or something. So it can be very wrong sometimes. Yeah, I don't know why it, they don't have that nice feature that Wikipedia does where you, there's you know, a little number that you can click on to find out what the source was for this information. That would be very useful in a chat GPT article if they're, they're pointing to the actual websites that they are drawing from to generate the answers that it generates. And so, uh, but I think all that's coming, Simon. I really think that we're, we're right now in uh, the very first stages of what's going to be a very long journey toward uh, making information accessible to everyone. Yes. I want to move on to the time in your life where you, you know, decided to be above average human and to donate one of your organs. And tell us a little about that, because this is something that's really interesting. <laughs> and uh, I want to kind of know your thinking behind it all. You know, where did this all come from? All right. So you've done your homework, Simon. I, I, uh, <laughs> and OK, so. In 1997, so this is a long time ago, um, I was reading an article about kidney donations. And, uh, and it was the one interesting thing in the article is sort of a kind of an eco economic type of guy is the disparity between the cost to the donor of a living kidney donation versus the benefit to the recipient. For instance, if I gave you $100, Simon, I would be $100 poorer, you would be $100 richer. But with a kidney donation, it's a, a the a, when a donor donates a kidney, it's not a significant medical event. The remaining kidney just kind of grows in size and ends up doing the work of two kidneys, and it doesn't lessen your lifespan or make you more likely to to die of kidney failure. But you're actually getting an opportunity to save someone's life on the other end, and so um, and so that disparity in the economics and on what a force multiplier giving a kidney can be for the recipient was just interesting to me. And so I made the decision that I wanted to donate one of my kidneys. And uh, the problem is at the time, I didn't know anyone who needed a kidney. And so I went, and so this is again, early days of the internet. I'm sorry, did I say 1997? It was 2007. And so, um, 2007. Yeah, 2007. And a website had just popped up called Matching Donors. And it would almost work like a dating website where people put up their profiles, like saying, Hey, I'm looking for a kidney. And, uh, and then, then prospective donors could take a look at them and if there was somebody they related to. And so there was a woman who needed a kidney. She seemed to be like a nice person, the kind of person that if I had donated a kidney anonymously, I would have liked her to get it. I, uh, I reached out for her, made contact with her and said, hey, listen, if you still need a kidney and we match, I'd be happy to donate to you and uh, went through the testing. Turned out we were a match. And then we both went to the hospital and I had a kidney removed and in installed into her. And uh, and then, you know, and I sewed up and I was back to work, you know, five, six days later. I was running, uh, you know, about a week later. And so. I was fine. It was no big deal to me, but it changed her life. It gave her an opportunity to get off dialysis and begin living a normal life. It's such a really kind of selfless thing to do. And I'm curious, was there some event in your life or something at that time that pushed you in that direction? That like Because it's not an everyday <laughs> thought. I mean, people might think, I will give away an organ when my body doesn't need it, when I'm dead. But was there something at that time that you kind of felt, I want to give back? What what pushed you in that direction? Simon, I wish I had some story about like a guy who died of kidney failure who taught me how to throw a baseball, but that's just not the case. <laughs> I, it, it was, it really, and it, it really was a situation where the more I learned about the living kidney donation process, the more it didn't seem like that much of a sacrifice. And, and I was 
treated very kindly by people after I did it. And everyone said nice things like you're saying now, but I think it's important that we need to get away from treating kidney donors as if they're these unusual heroes where, um, because it's really not that big of a sacrifice. It was, uh, it was no different than when I got it. Trust me, me getting my ears pierced for an undercover assignment was more painful and, uh, and had longer lasting effects on my life than giving a kidney to, I don't feel any different at all. My uh, filtration rate is fine. The there's no likelihood of me getting kidney disease from it. Um, there's really very little downside to the donor. And so for me, it was just an opportunity to help somebody just like when you, uh, you know, give a bum a $5 bill when he's panhandling on the street. Not not that my recipient was panhandling or that she's a bum, but it wasn't that big a deal to me, but it can make a difference in that person's life. Yeah, and she also worked within government services as well, didn't she? And, and- yeah, she's a victim specialist uh, for the prosecutor's office. So like in a domestic violence case, she's the one who would walk the victim into court and kind of sit with them in the courtroom and put their mind at ease because it can be a very terrifying experience for crime victims. And so that became a specialty a few you know decades ago of actually having a victim specialist kind of do the handholding and the social work for crime victims. And so the idea that she was involved in government service and, and broadly in law enforcement was attractive to me that's really good and i you know i have to commend you for that because even though as you said you don't want to be lauded as this like unusual hero or accidental hero or whatever it still was a very you know amazing thing to do and very selfless and i'm sure some people would say why but why are you doing it but you did it for your own reasons and she benefited and like you did that analogy with the hundred dollars that $100 you gave her was worth so much more, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, she appreciates it. And it's a weird friendship yeah. though, right? This is someone I didn't know ahead of time. And uh, and and now we have this sort of bond with each other. And so I was constantly being invited to like her family reunions and their, and all that. And at some point I had to reach out for her and say, listen, this was a no strings attached gift. I wasn't looking to buy a best friend. I'm thrilled to have you in my life. I'm thrilled. And I understand how appreciative you are. But, you know, we'd go out to lunch and she'd insist on paying. And it just became like, like you don't owe me anything. This was a no strings attached gift to you. Um, I'm happy to have done it. Um, the, the best repayment you can give me is by living a happy, healthy, productive life, which she has. And so we're still in touch. We're still friends, you know, uh, but, but it's no long, I, but it's a weird relationship, right? Because she's very appreciative of something I did and I don't, it's just, my personality is just awkward for me to have somebody kind of like thanking me all the time no of course and it would become awkward after a while but you know she'll never forget it and whatever and you know since that you've never had any complications with the other kidney it's all been fine yeah yeah yeah, yeah. the way it, exactly you, you when i go in for my annual physical one of the things they measure is your glomular filtration rate which is how well your remaining kidney is doing and mine's doing just fine when kidneys go bad simon they go bad in pairs there's never a situation where somebody has like kidney disease in their left kidney and their right kidney is just fine. It just doesn't happen. So my only greater risk would be if I had a, a trauma, if I was shot in my ki- in my one remaining kidney. And, but, um, but the likelihood of that seemed pretty low. And if so, then I just get a kidney transplant from someone else. Someone will pay it forward to me. And uh, so I, you know, I'm, get, I, I'm not a, I'm not a Muay Thai fighter. I don't, I'm not engaged in like knife fighting or anything like that. And so, but there's no other, you know, long-term effects to my life. Okay. And one thing I didn't mention was when you were in the FBI, you know, you were recipient of lots of awards and everything. So was, was that something when you would get an award for excellence in investigation or for any of these things, does that kind of make you strive then to be an even better investigator? No, I always found those things kind of awkward. Like, uh, it's nice for the agency to get to when one of their agents wins Hawaii law enforcement officer of the year. Cause I worked in Hawaii for seven years. And, um, but, and so it's a feather in the cap of the agency to me kind of walking up there and, you know, posing with the photo, like shaking some guy's hand was always just sort of weird and awkward. I don't mind being the center of attention, but I don't want it to be in that sort of environment. Uh, so the awards were never a big motivator for me, but I understood that they looked good for the agency and my squad. And so I was happy to be the face of that when I could. Okay. Okay. And how much now, like in your in, in private investigation world, do you spend a lot of time on that or are you semi-retired in a way? Because I can imagine no, I, I, you know, you're working all the time. 
Yeah, I'm busier than ever, sadly. I, I thought I'd be spending a lot more time floating in my pool. But um, but the clients have been pretty steady. Um, and the social media thing has sort of supercharged that because I ended up getting a following on TikTok quite unexpectedly, which generates clients. And um, and then so when I don't have any clients and I'm between clients, I spend my time marketing, kind of putting together videos and other things that are going to bring the next set of clients in the door. So it really hasn't felt much like retirement at all, but it's fine. I actually enjoy it. I mean, this is all this is what I like to do. Um, I like to investigate. And so um, um, it's some days I'd like it to be a little quieter, but I also don't want to go broke because I could use the money that I, you know, this is a job. And so, um, and so it's, it, but it's like being an Uber driver, right? You, you know, you're, I'm in the gig economy now because no one needs a private investigator until they need a private investigator. And so, so um, and when a client calls with a problem, I can, uh, you know, I try to help because that's, that's what I do. One thing I'm always curious with is sometimes when you see people who are on TV shows or, you know, and they're, they're presenting because of their experience in law enforcement or military, is that something like that bridge between the, the world of investigation and now social media? Would you ever like to do, you know, uh, some kind of a TV show where you could use all those skills? presenting and everything <laughs> if anyone wants to hire me to be on their tv show i i will take that call um i uh but uh, as of right now the the limited amount of television and video work i've done has all been yes. toward, with the goal of, of bringing in new clients to the private investigative agency but but if netflix wants to create a true crime show and have me be the voice or the face of that i would absolutely take that call I'm just not holding. You never know. You never know, Simon, but I'm not holding my breath for that. I, I think I probably have a face for radio. This isn't exactly what they're, you know, they're looking, they're looking for young, hard bodied names. Yeah, of course, of course. But they, but those young, hard bodies don't have that experience. And sometimes that charisma for presenting and having that world experience. So you never know because your videos are quite entertaining. And as I mentioned earlier, you, you can catch Tom on, you know, TikTok, Instagram and so on. So before we get let you go, Tom, you know, and uh, we want to thank you for coming on the show. And we want to kind of wish you the best with everything and wish you the best in your career as a private investigator. And would you like to tell us anything more about any more of your social media handles and stuff? Yeah, I think I'm uh, I'm on everything at Simon Investigations. And uh, it's Investigations with an S at the end. Or you can probably just Google Tom Simon and find me. Uh, somehow on Twitter, I am Simon Private I. But um, every day I post a one or one and a half minute video on either cases that I worked or broadly law enforcement or fraud matters. And, um, and I push it out on every social media platform, you know, LinkedIn, TikTok, Facebook, uh, Instagram, YouTube. And for some reason, Instagram has taken off much more so than the others, but it's the same content on all of them. So if any of your listeners want to have some fun crime stories or even to go through the archive of 200 to 300 videos, I, I'd be honored. And I just thank you for giving me access to your audience, Simon. This is a real fun interview. No, it's brilliant. I, I love hearing about these stories. And I like to get into the fine detail of someone's career and even you know what they do now. So Tom, I want to commend you for everything, for, for the work you've done in federal government and as an investigator and the work you're still doing. And it's great that you're branching into that social media where you can share your world with people like me and other people, giving us some access. So I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. You're doing a great job with the show here. Mr. Tom Simon, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, thank you very much, Tom Simon. Pleasure to have you on the show. And thank you for telling us all about your very interesting and varied career. You know, all the way from the FBI, your training has led you to this investigative career and you've you know investigated some amazing cases and solved so many of them and we want to say well done on that and thank you for coming on the show and sharing with us and best of luck in the future with everything that you do mr tom simon everybody okay to you the guest thank you very much for listening we hope you're enjoying the show please leave a review of the show if you can tell us how you feel tell us what you like and tell us what you don't like we like to hear everything so for me your host simon k this is the collective whisper podcast look after your friends your family and the people you love until the next time take care bye bye